Yeah, I don't know. 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 Yeah, Start, one class is hard, but yeah, so you have to try four. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Algorithms <laughs> with VJ. You still have to try four. Are you still on categories? Or structures? No. I'm going to do the embedded five, so systems class. I heard that was really easy. You still need the multi-thing data structures with data, three other categories. Do an algorithm. I'm picking the communication network. That's the NBA. Do you take it now? Yeah. Okay, so you already have two then. But I did not select it. I'm just doing the same thing. I think so. Yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah. Did you get it? Like grade-wise? Yeah, grade-wise I did, but professor said you have to decide if you want to put it. Like a place to upload it. Like I see it's two or one. Yeah, yeah. They told me that it's harder, but then you can get it. I think to me, I feel like... Yeah, because I talked to professor. Everyone, let's start. Okay. So this is the, the second password. So let me introduce the speaker. So, so this is Dugal Garg. So he's an assistant professor, industrial and enterprise systems engineering. And he's also affiliated with the computer science department in the UIUC. So he, his research uh, interests uh, lie in uh, algorithms and complexity uh, for uh, some of the most fundamental problems in economics and computation. So with a particular focus on allocation problems arising in first division and general equilibrium theory. So he has received uh, several awards, uh, NSF career, uh, exemplary theory paper in, uh, at ACM in uh, 2020, the informed Scoopman Prize, and the Dinkins Award for Excellence in Research 2022. I happened to know Jugal uh, when he was a postdoc at uh, Georgia Tech. And, uh, Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you so much, Yanis, for inviting me. And uh, good morning, everyone. So today's talk on EFX, it's a popular or most desirable Fairness notion for fair division. Uh, so what is fair division? So fair division, we want to divide items among agents. Like in this example, there are two agents and these are the items. So this is one particular allo allocation on the right-hand side. So, so we want to find a fair allocation and uh, this problem uh, is very ancient. Like uh, the, the mentions of this problem is uh, in the Bible and the ancient Greek mythology. So this is uh, like uh, dividing resources fairly among, uh, among agents is, uh, is a very old problem. So it has several applications even now, like uh, for example, vaccine distri distribution, divorce settlement, air traffic management and household chores. Uh, just to name a few. So the problem setup is uh, as follows, like uh, we will be talking about discrete fair division where we are given a set of N agents and a set of M indivisible items or goods. So indivisible means like each good can be only given to one agent, like laptop, phone, you cannot divide it. And we will assume that uh, agents have preferences like uh, each one has different preference, like someone like laptop, someone like uh, whatever, cell phone. So they have different preferences and they, these preferences are given by valuation functions and we will assume that they are additive valuations. Uh, so what is additive valuation? So it is like valuation function for every subset, there is a real number, like what is the value of a subset of goods? And we will assume additives, which means that for every good there is a valuation, like uh, let's say 10, 20, for each good, there is a valuation, like how much value each good provides to, let's say, IF agent, and if you give like multiple goods in a bundle, then the total value is, or value for the bundle is, the sum of the value for, of each good in the bundle. So it's just like uh, VI of S is uh, summation of G in S, VIG. So you just sum the value from each good in the bundle, and that is the value of the bundle. It's like uh, additive valuation. And the goal here is, uh, to partition these goods into n bundles, one for each agent. So let's say x1 to xn, where xi is the bundle given to agent i, and uh, we want a partition which is fair. Is the problem clear? But what is fair? 
right? <laughs> because like port allocation is fair that we need to worry about. But the problem clear. So we are these goods and we are agents. Agents come with preferences, and we assume that they are additive preferences, and we want to partition the goods among agents, which is fair. So one point essential fairness notion is uh, NB freeness. So we say that X the partition is NB free if there is no NB among okay. agents. So like the value of agent I from XI, XI is the bundle we are giving to agent I and its value for XI is VI of XI to be at least VI of XJ. So like you are applying the same valuation function VI here, but the value of I, XI for I is at least as much as value of any other bundle. So I does not envy anyone because this value for this own bundle is at least the value of any other bundle. And this should be true for every agent. It's like NB free. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask yeah, so, uh, I just wanted to understand if resource contention in say a CPU, GPU system can be modeled in this manner. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, yeah. if you can give an example, that would be. So, uh, so what? Do, yeah, you yeah, I need okay. to understand your problem, but so, I've seen the examples like that. Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, say we have uh, some kind of, um, I don't know, highly parallelizable tasks that are there. So, I would want it to do on the GPU rather than on the CPU. So, in that like kind who of, who are the agents? Which what are the goods? So, you need to like, and what kind of fairness you are? You yeah. Are so, um, it would probably be a resource allocation problem that where, where and what to allocate what resource at what point of time given a resource constraint pipeline. Say we have an autonomous vehicle pipeline. Okay, let's discuss this after the talk. Sure. Yeah. So de definitely like uh, there is a lot of uh, application in like scheduling or resource allocation. This is like resource allocation. Goods are resources. The only assumption is goods are indivisible. That means like you cannot fractionally divide them. So this is the, this is the only assumption I'm using. And one, like the, the most popular fairness notion is NB freeness, where like uh, no one envies any other bundle. Like everyone is happy with their own bundle, they don't envy any other event. So now the question is, once we have fixed the notion of fairness, then we want to understand whether we can always achieve such a notion. So like, can we always achieve NB freeness in uh, any instance, in every instance? And the answer is no, because like, uh, Suppose there is only one good and there are two agents. And since this good cannot be divided, so you need to give this good to one of the two agents and whoever gets it is very happy and whoever doesn't get it will envy the other agent, right? Who gets it? So we cannot achieve envy freeness in a very simple example. So envy freeness is, uh, is a nice notion, but it is too strong for the discrete setting. So we need to refine it because NB freeness cannot be achieved all the time. We want a notion which can be achieved in every instance. So one refinement or the popular or the closest analog of NB freeness is NB freeness up to any good, EFX. That is the title of my talk. So what is this? Here like we say that the allocation X is EFX. If VI of XI, that is the value of I from XI is at least the value of i from xj minus some good. So you just remove any single good, only one good. Like maybe xj contains 100 goods. You just remove any single good from xj, then i does not envy xj. So i may envy xj because we cannot achieve envy freeness, but envy vanishes as soon as you remove any single good from xj. And this should be true for, for every pair of i and j. So this is the relaxation of envy freeness where you need to remove one single good and any single good, the NB should vanish. It's just like up to one good, right? Up to any single good. So when uh, we want to find an allocation, uh, X uh, will satisfy this uh, condition that VI of XI is at least VI of XJ minus G for every good G in XJ. And this should be true between every pair of agents, every pair I and J of agents. So this is EFX. Now the question is, can we always satisfy, okay, let's first take an example to understand this notion. So let's say there are three goods, laptop, bag, and shoes. There are three goods, individual goods, and there are two agents, and these are the valuation. So what is this? So 25 
is the value of agent one for laptop, and ten is the value of agent one for bag, and ten for shoes, and for agent two, twenty, ten, and ten. So these are the values. So if you give, let's say, this particular location, let's consider this particular location when where you are giving laptop and bag to agent one, and uh, shoes to agent two, then what is the value of agent one? Twenty five plus ten. Additive value just you just sum the value of the single good in the bundle. So thirty five. And what is the value of agent two in this allocation? Ten. Because uh, agent two only gets uh, shoes, right? Do you think it's a fair allocation? Do you, what do you think? Is it is it uh, like it's of course not NV three because agent two will NV agent one because agent two's value for laptop and bag is thirty, and agent two is only getting ten. So of course there is NV from agent two to agent one, but agent one does not NV agent two because agent one is happy. So agent one gets thirty five. And the other bundle value is only ten. So agent one is very happy, but agent two is not happy. So what about EFX? Is it an EFX allocation? So of course, agent one does not NV agent two. We only need to look at the NV from agent two to agent one. So agent two NV is agent one. But does this NV vanishes if we remove any single good from agent one's bundle? Let's say if we remove laptop. Then the value of bag, the remaining value bag is ten. So there is no NV. We go ten and ten. But if you remove bag, then the value of the laptop is twenty, and uh, agent two is only getting ten. So this is not an EFX allocation because if you remove bag, then NV is still persists even if you remove bag. So this is like uh, this is not an EFX allocation because if you remove bag from agent one's bundle, agent two is still NV the rest of the bundle, which is just a laptop. So this is not an EFX allocation, but uh, you can uh, we can easily see that there is an EFX allocation. Simple, like you give laptop to agent one and uh, the other two goes to agent two. This is in fact an NV free allocation, but definitely NV free implies EFX, so it is NV free as well as EFX allocation. So is the definition of EFX clear to everyone? Okay. So now the question is: Is it always possible to achieve NV EFX? This was a very toy example. So I give you any set of agents, any set of goods. Do there always exist any EFX allocation? That is the question we are asking, and it turns out to be we don't know yet. It's a fair division, biggest open question. We don't know whether EFX allocation always exists, or there is a counter example where there is no EFX allocation. So this is like uh, considered fair division, biggest open question, and it is highly non-trivial even for three agents, even when there are only three agents. We don't need to even talk about hundred <laughs> or millions of agents. So, so this is the state of the art. So what we know, so we know that for two agents it always exists. So for two agents, if there are only two agents, you can always find an EFX allocation. For three agents, we recently proved that it exists. So this was a surprising result because uh, it seems to be a highly non-trivial problem. But we can prove that for three agents it is it exists EFX allocation, and for more than three agents we still don't know. Like four agent, we still don't know whether it exists or not. Since uh, there has been, uh, of course, uh, this problem turns out to be so challenging. So the researchers started considering relaxations because maybe EFX is uh, like a very strong notion. So one relaxation is EFX with charity. So what here? What you do? You don't allocate all the goods. Maybe you keep some goods unallocated. So for example, if you don't allocate anything, then It's EFX for NV free because no one has anything, right? So we want to we want to allocate as many goods as as many goods as we want. So we want to minimize the number of unallocated goods. So what we know that EFX exists if you don't allocate at most n minus two unallocated goods. If you are if you like some n minus two goods you don't allocate, then the rest of the goods you can allocate, and those that allocation will be EFX. That is what we know. And another relaxation is uh, like uh, uh, approximation. So we just uh, relax the condition that like uh, this thing, like uh, the EFX condition, we put an alpha here. We lower the threshold. Like even after removing one good, you still uh, lower the threshold for alpha less than one. So this is called alpha EFX. That uh, now the question is, uh, what is the maximum alpha for which we can achieve approximate EFX? So what we know so far, we know that 0.618 EFX allocation exists, and this is the highest we know. 
0.618. So even like uh, EFS is open, but if you are increasing anything uh, beyond 0.618 is also open. So this is the best we can do. And the third relaxation is like you merge both the things. You consider approximate EFX with charity. Charity means you don't allocate. Charity means like whatever is unallocated, you can give to charity. So that is the meaning of charity. Because like, because if we allocate everything, then agents are unhappy. So maybe it's better not to allocate everything. So, so now the third notion is approximate EFX with charity. So because here the, the, the unallocated number of goods is order n. So we can achieve a better bound here. We can get a square root n, but uh, we need to uh, we need to only get one minus epsilon EFX. So we 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 relax the condition of EFX to alpha EFX, and then we improve the bound on the charity. So these are the three. Yes. So uh, in the case of the charity, do you have any assumption on the number of goods? We want to minimize the number of goods. Okay. That is our criteria. We want to minimize the number of goods unallocated. We want to allocate as many goods as we want but how many goods we can allocate. So the best we can do is, maybe in some instance, we can allocate everything but n minus two goods. Because if you try to allocate uh, these n minus two goods, then you will lose the EFX. Um, so m, m, which is the total number of m can be, like the number of goods can be much bigger than number of agents. n is the number of agents. n is the number of agents, yeah. Makes sense, right? So, so in this talk, we will I will try to go over these results. So we will start with n equals two. That there is a very simple algorithm for two agents. Then we will see like uh, with charity how to achieve uh, EFX with charity. Like, and then we will see n equals three because uh, these techniques are uh, somehow related. And if we have time, then we will see this result. Okay. So this is the plan for this talk. So let's start with n equals two. So there are two agents, and we want to achieve EFX. So there is a very simple algorithm for this. It's based on divide and choose protocol, <coughs> which is also applicable in many different settings. But what is this? So you pick any any of the two agents, let's say agent one, which can be any agent, because there are only two agents. And agent one, find the partition of all the goods into two bundles, as equal as possible. Because this is, this is a discrete good, so you may not get equal value for both the, both the bundles in the partition. <coughs> So you want agent one to partition the goods as equal as possible. And in fact, agent one can get a partition Y and Y prime such that Y is Y prime is a better bundle for agent one. V1 of Y prime is at least V1 of Y, like one of better bundle of, of for agent one. Y prime is a better bundle, but Y is also not very bad. Because if you remove any good from Y prime, any good, then it is better than, Y is better than, Y prime, if you remove any good from Y prime. So this is like EFX, because Y is an EFX. Because Y prime is better, Y prime is the better bundle for agent one. But agent one, if agent one gets Y, then it is also EFX because Y and Y prime is just like, uh, just one good, any any single good. And the good thing is that you can find such a partition very easily. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you. And then like, of course you can ask me after the talk if you, uh, but there is a very simple algorithm which will give you such a partition. Okay, so now we have such a partition for agent one. Now agent one offers this partition to agent two. That okay, here is y and y prime. Choose whatever you like. Now agent two will choose whatever she likes. Now we say we uh, the claim is that this is an EFX allocation. So it's, agent two is happy, right? Agent two is choosing the better bundle. So agent two is in in fact envy free, right? Because agent two is choosing the better of whatever she likes uh, between y and y prime, and agent one is also happy according to EFX because if agent one gets y prime, then it's an NB free allocation in fact. But if agent gets agent one gets y, then it is also NB EFX because <laughs> because y and y prime are such that that if you remove any single good from y prime, there is no NB. So it is an EFX allocation. So this is a very simple protocol which gives EFX allocation for two agents. And the things become very complicated when there are three agents. For two agents, this is a very simple algorithm, but when there are three agents, things become very complicated. And uh, that's why it was open for very long time. Okay, so next is uh, EFX with at most N minus two unallocated goods. So we want to minimize the number of unallocated goods and achieve EFX guarantee for whatever we have allocated. 
because if you don't allocate anything, then it is a fact. But we want to give some goods and we can do up to n minus two unallocated. So for this, I need a concept of NB graph. So this is a very popular concept in uh, discrete pair division. It's very natural. So what is it? So you, you create a graph because it's an NB graph. So you create a graph where the vertices of graphs are the agents. For each agent, you create a vertex. So there are n agents, so there are n vertices in the graph. Now you, so this, these are these are the n vertices in the graph. And now you put an edge, directed edge from i to j, if i n b j. So it has to be the inequality is, has to be v i x i greater than v i x j. No, no, I think this is fine. v i of x i is less than v i of x j, that means i n b j, right? This is n b free. It is, it is n b. Because i thinks the value from x j is bigger than value from x i. So there is an NB from I to J. So you put a directed edge from I to J. So this is the NB graph. So let's say we have some allocation X. Now you, cre you can create this graph because the vertices of the graph are the corresponding to agents and you put a directed edge from I to J if I NB is J is bundle. Let's say this is the graph. Now what you look, what we, so this is the NB graph and what we see in this graph is there is a cycle, right? So what can we do with the cycle? So what is what is the cycle is representing? Cycle say, saying that A4 prefers this bundle, agent six prefers this bundle, and agent five prefers this bundle, and agent three prefers this bundle. So we can just circulate the bundle along the cycle and get a better allocation, right? <laughs> because like, like it's like if the cycle of two agents, like I prefer your bundle, you prefer my bundle, so let's exchange, right? So this is how we can just uh, if there is a cycle, we can just exchange the bundle along the cycle, and uh, we will get this graph. So whenever there is a cycle, you can just exchange the bundle. And uh, when you are exchanging the bundle, you are improving the evolution of agents in the cycle and you are not touching anything outside the cycle. So no one is going worse off, like no, you are not decreasing anyone's evolution, but you are increasing some agent's evolution. So it's a better allocation. So whenever there is a cycle, we can always remove the cycle. So we can, without loss of generality, assume that and the graph is a cyclic because if it is cycle, we can just remove the cycle by exchanging the bundle along the cycle. So let's without a plus generality, there is no cycle. So if there was a cycle, we could have already removed the cycle. So far so good. Questions? We need another concept, most envious agent. So it's also, okay, so let's see. So let's say we have an allocation X and uh, a sum S. So this is the xi, vi of xi for agent i bundle xi, and there is some another bundle s. Now you see that in this picture, i prefers s to xi, because the, <coughs> the value of i is bigger than value of i for xi. And we want to understand like how big is this bundle? What is the minimum number of goods in s that you can give to i, and still i prefers that? So here like uh, how many goods? One, two, three, four, five. You don't need to give five goods from S to I because I will be happy with just two goods in S, right? So we, the most envious agent for this, like you find the least, the smallest subset of S, YI, which is still better than XI. The smallest in terms of the number of goods. Make sense? So you have something, but you see that what is the smallest number of goods from this set, you still envy. So that is YI. Let's say this number is kappa x something. Now, we want to find an agent who has the minimum kappa s. That means like who is happy with the minimum number of goods in a bundle. So for example, let's say this is the v1 of x1, v2 of x2, and v3 of x3. So by the way, we have not allocated all the goods. So we will be allocating one at a time. <laughs> or somehow in some procedure, initially everyone has nothing. And then, uh, then we want to allocate them in such a fashion that like uh, we maintain the EFX condition. So let's say X1, X2, X3 are the current bundle of one and two and three. And uh, there is a set S which is unallocated so far. And we are looking at that like how much minimum number of goods from S each agent is happy with or still can be. <laughs> So for one, there are two goods. For let's say two, there are three goods. You need to give three goods from S to make him better than X2. 
for three, you need to give four goods, let's say, to make him better than X3. So which is the most envious agent? He said that one is the most envious agent because one is just happy with just two goods from S. Just number. Because for from, from S, if you look at how much, how many minimum number or what is the smallest size of S, you can give such that agent one still likes that. So we have counted this thing for all the agents. So for one, there are only two goods. Two, there is three goods. For three, there are four goods. So we say that one is the most envious agent. Yes. Yeah, X1, X2, X3 is at some point. Initially, it will be empty. Okay, so X1, X2, X3 is some allocation. And S is like, let's say, outside bundle. And we want to see that, like, how much minimum number of goods from S, everyone is still gets better utility than their current allocation. So for agent one, you need to give two goods from S. For agent two, you need to give three goods from S. Because if you give less than three, then it will not envy. Because like, uh, because like, if you give two goods, then uh, of course it will go, it will not be envy. Because that is the definition of Kappa. Is that clear? So we say that agent one is the most envious agent here. There could be multiple most envious agent. It's fine. Maybe like this is just an example. Maybe like uh, multiple agents say that I am happy with like only two goods from S. So then all of them are most envious agents. Okay. So here the most envious agent is A1 because A1 is just happy with two goods from S. Now the good thing about this is that no one envies Y1. If you give Y1 to a agent one. Let's say we change the agent one's allocation from X1 to Y1, then no one envies Y1 up to a single good. So if you remove any single good, that envy will go away. I think this is the key. Because Y1 was the smallest size bundle, if you remove any single bundle and any single good from Y1, then no one envies that rest of the bundle. Because if someone envies, then the definition says that it was the smallest good, the smallest, sub, the smallest size good. So no one envies Y1 up to any single good. So it is like an EFX allocation. So you can just replace the bundle of one from X1 to Y1 and uh, no one envies Y1 up to any single good. So this is what we will do. And we have increased the valuation of Y1, one, agent one, and has not changed the valuation of other agents. Okay. So we say that champion, so we say that a given an allocation X, we say I champions the set S if I is the most envious agent. So it's just a definition that we find the most envious agent based on the smallest subset. And then we say that uh, those agents which, which are only happy with the smallest subset, they are champion. Okay. Now let's apply this idea to the NV graph. So let's say we have NV graph, which is a single source. Source in a graph, like a directed graph, that means there is no NV to that vertex. Source means like there is no NV. And since we have already assumed that the graph is acyclic, because if there is cycle, we can remove the cycle. So every acyclic uh, directed graph has a source. Okay. So there is a source and let's say there is a single source. So what is the good thing about source? No one envies the source. So if you want to allocate more goods, where will you give? You give it to the source because no one envies source. Because you don't give it to other agents because someone already envies other agents. Why you want to increase the envy? So the, the idea or the natural thing to allocate more goods to the source agent. So we allocate, let's say, one good from outside if there is something to the source agent. So let's say G is the good, unallocated good. We add it to the bundle of the source agent. X1 union G. Now, as you give one more good to the source agent, there could be envy, right? Maybe other agents start envying now because now agent one's bundle is like X1 union G. So there are these, uh, these let's say, now we find the, the, these are the three agents who envy the X1 union G. And uh, let's say this is the most envious agent for this bundle. Among these three agents, you find the most envious agent. Most envious agent means you look at the, minimum smallest subset of X1 union G in terms of the number of goods, which is still the agent envies. So let's say SA1 is the most envious agent or the champion for this bundle, X1 union G. Is that okay? So now what we, what we can do? So we can just like, uh, this is a cycle, because like uh, we just look at the edge from the most envious agent, so you get a cycle. 
because there was a single source, so it has to be a cycle, and then we have exchange bundle along the cycle. We exchange bundle along the cycle, and uh, we give agent one x two, agent two x four, agent four x seven, and what we get we give to s seven. We don't give x one in NG. We only give the the smaller subset, which is still prefers of, uh, to x seven. So that is y seven. This is the this is the definition of champion. You look at the smallest subset of x one in NG, which a seven is still n bs. So you give that bundle, and the rest of the good you throw away to the set of unallocated. So you don't give x one in NG to agent seven because otherwise uh, it will create problem. So we will give only y seven. Now all the n bs will be transferred to y seven, but they are like weak n bs. There is no strong n b. Strong n b means like you remove any single good from y seven. There is no n b. So this is the definition of Y seven. So Y seven is the smallest subset of X one energy, which you can give to any agent, which uh, increases the valuation. But if you remove anything from it, then there is no energy. So this is like if this was a EFX allocation, then this is also an EFX allocation. And uh, by moving from this allocation to this allocation, what we have done, we have increased the valuation of all these agents. Right. Because the cycle, when we circulate the bundles along the cycle, the valuation of all the agents on the cycle have strictly increased, and the valuation of all the agents outside the cycle has not changed. <coughs> so we have like uh, we have found an allocation which is uh, Pareto dominates the previous allocation. So X prime is the new allocation, and this sign says that which is better than X because we have not decreased anyone's valuation, and we have increased some agents' valuation. So this is like Pareto dominates dominates X, and X prime is EFX. So we started with an EFX allocation, and we have improved the. We have found another EFX allocation which is better than the previous one. So what is the starting point? You start with the empty allocation, and you keep adding items or goods to the agents, to the source, and keep reducing these cycles, and you are getting better and better, better, and eventually it has to converge like that. So this is good, but the problem is there could be multiple sources. The NB graph need not have just one single source. It could have different component, and there could be multiple sources. This is the problem. Otherwise, if there is a single source, then you can always make progress because the cycle you will get the cycle, and you can make progress. But if the NB graph has multiple sources, then we cannot apply that technique because suppose these are the three sources in this NB graph, and uh, let's say there are three unallocated goods. We have not allocated G1, G2, G3. Now, what is the what we do? You add G1 to the source of the first component, let's say S1, and the the champion comes from the other component. Because if the champion agent comes from the same component, then you have a cycle and you can make progress, like we did in the <coughs> last slide. But if the champion comes from the other component, then there is no cycle. You have not, you don't create a cycle. So what should we do now? You add another good. To S two. Now again, if you get a cycle, then you can improve. But if you don't get a cycle, and then you can you don't get a cycle if the champion comes from the third component. Now you add a, another unallocated good to S three, and uh, now there has to be cycle, right? You cannot avoid a cycle. If the if the champion comes from from the same component, then of course you have a cycle. If the champion comes from here, then you have a cycle. If the champion comes from here, so. There has to be a cycle, and if there is a cycle, then we can make a progress. We can make progress. We can improve the valuation of some agents and don't don't uh, make any agents worse off. So we need three goods to make progress in the worst case, because the champion can be from other component. But if there are three sources, then uh, and you have three unallocated goods, then you can always make progress. So this says that if the number of unallocated goods is at least n, because how many sources will be there in a in an NV graph? In the worst case, n. So there are n vertices. Maybe all vertices are like there is no n v. So there there could be n sources. So you can always make progress if there are at least n unallocated goods. And you get a champion cycle, and you can improve the allocation by circulating bundle along the champion cycle. So you are going from one EFX allocation to another EFX allocation by increasing valuation of some agents, and you keep doing this. But the problem happens if there are n agents. There are n sources, but there are only n minus one unallocated goods. Then maybe we may not create a cycle. So this is why 
we can uh, we get n minus one unallocated goods easily. This this proved that like uh, we can allocate everything up to n minus one good. And for one more good, you need to do some more work, which I will not describe here. So the best you can do is n minus two unallocated. So you can allocate everything, but maybe n minus one goods. N minus one, I already showed you the proof. So for, for one more good, you need to do some more work. Okay, so next is three agents where we want to allocate everything. So this N minus two already says that for three agents, we can allocate everything but just one good. Because like this, this, uh, this uh, result says that for three agents, we can allocate everything and get an EFX allocation, just one good. But allocating one more good becomes <laughs> very challenging. So this is like, uh, let's see how we do. So we break the, we, it's based on the case by case analysis. So we break the cases in, uh, by enumerating, uh, by, by treating this, uh, the problem into three different cases, depending on the number of sources in the NV graph. What are the possibility for number of sources in the NV graph? There are three vertices, right? Because three agents. So either there is a single source, or there are two sources, or there are three sources. So these are the three cases. For one source, we already know we can make progress. If there is one source, you can always allocate even one single good. So for one source, we can always make progress. For two sources, and now let's first discuss the three sources. Suppose there are three sources in the NV graph. Then uh, let me not go about, about this. So what we can show is that you can still make progress by some more complicated ideas, uh, by circulating bundle and doing some something, you can make progress when there are three sources in the NV graph. Now comes the two sources. And uh, surprisingly, we found an example where you cannot make progress. There is an example where it is not possible to make progress if there are only two sources. So there is an example, or there exists a partial EFX allocation and unallocated good G such that you, there is no allocation, which is better than the partial allocation. So that means some agent has to suffer if you want to allocate more goods. You, like what is our potential function so far? We don't want anyone to suffer. We want maybe agents remain same or they get better value. But uh, this uh, example says that if you want to allocate more goods, then uh, at least one of the agent has to suffer. You need to decrease the value of some agent. So this is the example. And so we cannot use uh, this technique. So then uh, this is the example, which I will not go into uh, detail. So. In this example, we, the, what we are doing is that the six agent, six goods, there are seven goods, so six goods are already allocated. And this is the allocation, and this is the seventh good, which is unallocated. And if you add it to, if you try to add it, and uh, add it such that the allocation is EFX, then some agent has to suffer. So, so then we come up with a new potential function. It's not like the our potential function was, you don't want anyone to suffer. Now the new potential function is you relabel the agents. You fix the agents. Okay, you are agent A, you are agent B, you are agent C, and uh, you can relabel them in the beginning and the, and consider this uh, potential function, which is lexicographic. So lexicographic means that uh, it's like a dictionary. So lexicographic potential function. So if like you are improving the agent evolution, then you are allowed to decrease the agent evolution, right? It's a lexicographic. So it's like A is higher, a higher priority. If you can increase A's evolution, it's okay if B and C are decreasing. You are still making progress. So this is the lexicographic potential and uh, the Pareto dominance, the dominance uh, potential function, which we considered before, it implies lexicographic, but not the vice versa. Lexicographic potential function may need to decrease the evolution of some agents. So then we prove that you can always make progress in this new potential function, lexicographic. So given any partial allocation, partial means you have not allocated all the goods, you can make progress such that this potential function, the lexicographic potential function is better. So of course it can, because it's a discrete problem, you cannot keep, so it has to converge. So this implies that EFX exists for three agents. Question? <coughs> I've not given all the details, but uh, given you the high level idea. So it's like uh, the concept is NB graph, and uh, we want to keep adding goods so that like uh, no one decreases, but we are not able to do that for when there are two sources. So we consider this new potential function where you are allowed to decrease someone. And it works. And unfortunately, this does not work for four agents. 
So there is an example, even this potential function does not work for four regions. So we're like, even it's not possible to improve the lexical or potential function. So yeah, so maybe like uh, some other potential function may be needed for four regions, four or more. Okay, so finally, like uh, I have like, how much time I have? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, 10 minutes, yeah. Okay. So the finally, like, uh, let me just talk about approximate EFX with charity. Uh, so we want to improve the bound, this order and bound to order square root n, uh, but by losing a little bit on EFX. So this problem reduces to a graph theory, extremal uh, graph theory problem. So, so what we do, so we classify the goods into two categories, high valuable good or high demand goods or low demand goods. So we say that good G is valuable to I if the value of I for G is at least epsilon time value of I for this current bundle. So like G is like giving at least epsilon time the current bundle. So like it's valuable. If it is less than epsilon, so it's not valuable. Okay. So we classify the goods into two category, high demand goods, HX. So that means there are many agents who find the good valuable and low demand goods, there are very few agents who find the value, the good value. Okay. So now the, the reduction is like this. You start with a partial one minus epsilon EFX allocation. So in all these algorithms, what is happening is that we are not losing the condition. So in the previous, the three agents case, we always maintain the EFX guarantee for whatever we have allocated. We started with an empty allocation, which is EFX, and you keep maintaining EFX allocation and just improving some potential function. Here also the same thing you maintain the condition that the current allocation or whatever you have allocated, it is one minus epsilon EFX allocation. You can start with empty allocation. That's what we will start. And you keep adding goods such that you improve something. So here we start with the partial one minus epsilon EFX allocation. And we consider the two cases based on the, based on the, the size of the high demand goods and low demand goods. If the, if the number of high demand goods are bigger than some threshold, then we can make progress. So there are many goods which are high demand goods so we can make progress or if the number of low demand goods are also bigger than some threshold rd which i will describe in the next slide then also we can make progress and uh, using this we get uh, a very good bound that uh, if both like both these thresholds are not satisfied that means hx is less than this number lx is less than this number then we cannot do anything and this this is the number of unallocated goods and this is like uh, a square root n if epsilon is constant. Okay, so this is the this is the proof thing, and uh, again come back to the champion cycle. So you remember that uh, if there are three unallocated goods and three sources, then we can make progress. <coughs> there has to be always a champion cycle. But if there are three sources and two unallocated goods, then we don't know because we cannot get a champion cycle. And we want to expand this using the one minus epsilon effects. So for this, like uh, we create a bigger graph, like it's called group champion graph. So what is group champion graph? Let's say there are three goods, G1, G2, G3, which, is, which are low demand goods. Low demand goods means there are few agents who find them valuable. So we create three partite graph. The vertex in one first partite is based on G1, which are the, which are the agents who find G1 valuable. And what second part, you put the agents who find G2 valuable. In the third part, you put the what I say, uh, agents who find G3 valuable. So this is like that. So this is like agent one finds uh, G1 valuable and you put the entire component of A1, the agent one, in this uh, group champion graph. This component is of the NB psychic, NB graph component. Because every agent is part of some component in the NB graph. So you put all these, uh, all these uh, components here and uh, the let's say the the size of each uh, the number of agents in each component is at most d because this is the condition d is just some number now what we have if you add g2 to this agent this source then where the champion or whatever the champion agent edge will come because g2 these agent find valuable right because it if G2 no one finds valuable, then you can of course give it to the source because everything is like less than epsilon. So because it's a source agent, no one envies. So you someone should uh, find the G2 valuable, then only there is a problem. So this this, this envy will come from the second component. 
and uh, you add G2 anywhere, you will find an NV like this. And you add G, G2 here, again, there is an NV from the second component. If you add G2, then you get edges from the second component, second part. If you add G1, then you get the edges from the first component. If you add G3, then you get uh, edges from the third component because this is the this is the set of agents who find G3 valuable. So if you could try to give G3 to some agent, they they want to they are not happy. Kind of. So so this is the this is the graph, and you can see that each vertex in uh, in this part has an <coughs> NV edge. If you want to allocate G3, G2, and so on, and uh, and uh, now the question is how many parts suppose we we can give g3 here g1 here g2 here and we get a cycle suppose we get a cycle then what does that mean if you get a cycle then you can make progress cycle always makes progress because you can just circulate the bundles along the cycle and make some agents happy and other agents of course are not affected so we want cycles so now the question is how many parts can we have such that there is no such cycle? Because if there is no such cycle, so we cannot make progress. It's exactly the same concept like uh, unallocated goods that whenever there is a cycle, we can make progress. So the question is when we cannot make progress or when can there be no cycle? So N minus one unallocated goods and N sources, maybe there is no cycle. But if there are more than N minus one, then there has to be cycle. The same question we are asking here, how many parts can there be such that there is no such cycle? Because if there is a cycle, we can make progress. So this is just a graph theoretical problem. So we are, RD is the largest number, the number of parts in a k-partite graph where each part has at most d vertices. And for any two parts, there is an incoming edge uh, from every part to every part. And there is no cycle that visits every part at most once. So you don't need to even, it's not an EFX problem, it's a graph theoretic problem. We want to find the minimum number, uh, the largest RD, because if it is like uh, more than that, then of course there has to be a cycle and we can make progress. So what is the largest RD such that there is no cycle? And uh, as I said, if there is a, if the number of unallocated goods is bigger than RD, then, the, then we can make progress because there has to be a cycle. The definition of RD is the largest RD, largest K such that there is no cycle. Okay, so for let's say if there is only one R1, one, so there is only one agent. So I we can show that if there is only R1 is at most one, because there is only one agent in B1, there is only one good. If you create another part with A2, then as the definition said there is an incoming edge from every part to every part. So you will, of course, there has to be edge like this because there is no other choice and there has to be edge like this. So this is a cycle. So that means that R1 cannot be bigger than one. And similarly, R2, like uh, I don't have time, so I will not go it. R2 cannot be more than two. Because if R2 is bigger than two, then you will find a cycle. So, so we, we can be show that RD is at most order D, and which gives the bound on the charity that if uh, it is bigger than RD, which is like a square root N, then uh, you will always able to find cycle and make progress. So, so this is uh, this is how we get our result, and uh, and you can see there are so many open questions. For four agents, we don't know if EFX exists, and the best we can do with unallocated goods is the partial EFX allocation is n minus two unallocated goods, n minus three log n constant. We don't know, and uh, for approximate EFX 0.618 is best. We don't know, and this is the charity. Even by reducing the the relaxing the EFX notion to approximate EFX, this is the best we can do. So we don't know if we can make progress on, we can get better bound on the number of votes in the charity. So let's stop here. Thank you very much. Questions? Any questions? Yes. What about like very large, like let's say it's like a very large N. Is it like, do you think it would be easier to prove that like it's not possible, it doesn't exist because it's just so complex? Yeah, so EFX problem, yeah, very good question. So EFX problem is so notorious, like, like according to me, it's a very challenging problem. Like it may happen that for six agents, EFX exists, but for five agents, EFX does not exist. So there is no monotonicity. It's not like that if you prove that for six agents, EFX exists, so it will imply 
it it also exists for five agents and similarly if it exists for six agents and 